Beautiful. All right, well, let's all stand in honor of the Word of God this morning. Grab your Bible there, turn to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. Amen. We're going to read just one verse, and then I'll let you be seated. Isaiah chapter 55. And I had a, I had a, I was going to preach out of the same chapter for the Sunday school and the morning service. And uh, so, uh, and I, uh, Brother Garraway took enough time, and it was perfect, brother. I mean, I, I appreciate it, brother. I needed it, and I knew you didn't want to hear me teach. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine both. So it's going to be about two hours. And it, No, I'm just kidding. No, amen. But I'll give you a little bit of both because they kind of were meant to coincide with each other. And uh, the Lord spoke to my heart this past week on this chapter while we were soul winning and reminded me of some truths. And, uh, and I wanted to preach it to you, amen. And it's encur- it was an encouragement to me. I hope it'll be an encouragement to you. Isaiah chapter 55, we're going to read verse number 8. Isaiah chapter 55, verse number 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for a wonderful day that you've given to us. Ask Heavenly Father Lord, that you'd bless the message this morning. I pray that you'd bless, Lord, all that's done and said. May it be for your honor and your glory. Heavenly Father, Lord, I can't preach. Lord, without you, Holy Spirit, you've got to work on the hearts. I can't work on hearts. I can't speak to the hearts of God's people. Holy Spirit, that's your job. And I'm just going to do my best to preach the message I believe that you've given to me. I ask Heavenly Father Lord, that you would forgive me for where I fail you and just help me to preach exactly what you'd have me to say, nothing more, nothing less. Forgive me, Father, for where I fail you and where I've done wrong. And I just ask that Heavenly Father Lord, you'd use me as a vessel. Not a very good vessel, but I pray that you'd use me as a vessel, Lord, to be a, a help to God's people this morning. May we be encouraged. May we be strengthened. May we, Lord, and, uh, just hear the truth of God's Word and say it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. We love you. We thank you. ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Isaiah chapter 55, uh, we read there verse number 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Well, this past week we got to go do some soul winning, and I enjoyed getting, uh, getting a chance to go out and win people to Christ. But I wanted to tell you a story uh, from this past week and use it, and God reminded me of it through, this, uh, through the text. And uh, I just wanted to tell you something. We were out, Brother Garraway and I, uh, Monday or Tuesday. I can't remember exactly. I have the date written on the 3x5 card. We went to a, an apartment complex way out uh, by Broadway out in the center of town, and uh, Brother, Gary and I, Brother Garraway and I were soul winning. We were kind of starting at the top, working our way down. And, uh, and Brother Garraway was teaching me how to be a silent partner. And uh, you know, so the Lord's been working on my heart about being a silent partner. I'm not used to being a silent partner. And uh, so I've been working on that, you know. And it's been, uh, my wife loves it, brother. I mean, she appreciates that. She's like, she needed a silent partner. So you're doing a good, you know, so she appreciates it now. But I was going with him from door to door, and I was getting, uh, you know, getting a chance to knock on a few doors. And uh, the Lord opened a, a door for me to give the gospel to a young man named Chase. Amen. It was a blessing. I, he opened the door and uh, kind of saw me. It was one of those where, you know, a guy in a shirt and tie, you could tell he's not really had somebody knock on his door uh, before, uh, you know, a guy in a shirt and tie like this. He's like, oh, you know, hello, you know, and I was like, hey, you know, Pastor Haley from Amazing Grace Baptist Church. And uh, you could tell that his life was pretty rough. Amen. You could tell life had really taken its toll. And uh, he just kind of was like, you know, he was there and he wasn't. And I said, hey, just like to invite you to church. He's like, well, you know, I don't really go to church. And uh, you could tell he was in some, he was in some pretty rough sin. Amen. And, uh, and I hope that he'll get a chance to come visit. Uh, he said he would like to, but he was in some pretty rough sin. And uh, it was a blessing to get to go and give him the gospel and as I was giving that to him, amen, I invited him to church. And then as I told him, I said, hey, can I tell you how you can know that if you die that you'd go to heaven? And before now, you know, when you're talking to people, you invite them to church. Yeah, sure, you know, whatever. Yeah, they, eh, okay, well, I'll think about it. And then you tell them, say, hey, do you know if you die that you'd go to heaven? You know, and, and people begin to look at you and go, you know, uh, not really, but who knows? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever gotten that. You know, who really knows? You know, I, you know, if you, it'd be, you know I say, well, and I always ask, Brother Gary was talking about that transition line. I always ask him, I say, well, if I could tell you how you could know, would you like to? You know, and he said, he's like, well, you know, yeah, sure. And so I started giving him the gospel, got a chance to uh, give him the gospel and show him how that Jesus loves him, that he died for him. And you can see people that God's working on, you can see through their eyes how that they are seeing how they, you're not telling them they've got to come to church and read their Bible and be this great Christian and give up sin and, get, and, and all this stuff. You're just telling them how that Jesus loved them, he died for them, gave his life. And he began to realize everything that Jesus has done. He realized he was a sinner. He realized he deserved hell, but that Jesus would save him. And I love, like Brother Garraway said, use that word in Romans 10, 13. It says, for whosoever. 
Amen. And you see people when they see that verse and they see the word whosoever. And you tell them that word whosoever means anybody. And I told him, I said, Chase, I said, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter who you are. I said, God said he loves anybody. Amen. Amen. That means God loves the murderer. God loves the thief. God loves the homosexual. God loves everybody. And you could see in his eyes, he began to see God loves him. I said, hey, Chase, I said, would you, you know, and, and it went from being where, you know, I didn't really want to speak to, yeah, I'd love to accept Jesus as my Savior. And I began to think about, boy, what a blessing that that is, because sometimes, you know, I didn't really think God was working on his heart. You know, you meet people, you don't really think, well, that, you know, God, God can't be working here. Well, you know, and Brother John and I were talking about it. Ah, you know, you, you meet people and you think, well, God's not working on their heart. You know, but God reminded me of this verse. I want you to see this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. I want to preach you a sermon this morning. What in the world is God thinking? Hold on with me. What in the world is God thinking? Look over here at the beginning of the verse, or beginning of the chapter. Isaiah chapter 55, verse number 1. The Bible says, Ho... Everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and, will, and milk without money and without price. Well, the average person, when you read that, you begin to think, what in the world is God thinking? God says, everyone that thirsteth, come. God, do you understand how, how many everyone is? That's a lot of people. Everybody that thirsteth, God says, come. Amen. That'd be like us holding a dinner out here at the church and say, hey, anybody that's hungry, come. Well, I don't know too many people that don't get hungry once in a while. Amen. And uh, we would have a lot of people just put up a sign and say, hey, everybody that's hungry, come, free dinner. Boy, we'd, uh, we'd have to make a couple trips, amen, because we had that uh, Tuesday night soul winning, amen, and we had a lot of people come. I didn't have enough hamburgers, amen. I knew everybody coming was hungry. So I said, Sarah, you're going to have to get some more burgers, amen, because people are hungry, amen. And like Jason said, like I said, when you get hungry and angry, then you're hangry, amen. And I wanted people not to be hangry. But you know what? People get hungry. And God knows there are people that are thirsty. But God says, everyone. Boy, I love that word. Everyone that thirsteth, God says, come. Anybody that's thirsty, anybody looking for Jesus, anybody that wants to know more about God, anybody that wants to know about heaven, anybody that wants to know that there's a God in heaven that loves them, God says, everyone that's thirsteth, come on, amen. And I, when I was giving him the gospel and thinking about and then God gave this to me, I was reading my Bible the next morning and I said, Lord, that was great to see how I wasn't really thinking that that boy would get saved and then God saved him and he, God was working on his heart. It, God reminds, it, reminds us because we may not always know who's thirsty, but everybody's welcome. Now, there are some people that aren't thirsty, some people that aren't looking for God, some people that don't care, they won't want to give you the time of day. You don't know who those are, but all you can do is hold out the cup of God's Word, the cup of water, and just say, hey, if you're thirsty, God says, come. Amen. Amen. The Bible the Bible's compared to the water of the Word of God. Why? Because people are thirsty. Amen. What do they want to drink of? They want a drink of God. Amen. People don't want our opinion when we go out soul winning. People don't want our philosophy. They don't want our political endorsement. Amen. They don't want all of the other things that go on in life. People are thirsty. And the only thing that can satisfy is God's Word. I mean, that's why it's so important when we go soul winning, we give out God's Word and we tell people and we show people from the Bible. You know why? Because people go to churches all over town and they never get a cup of God's Word. They get a cup of everything else. They get the cup of joy, a uh, man's opinion of gladness and live life good and your life will be happy and all those things that go on in church. They get a cup of rock music. They get a cup of rap music anymore in these churches. They get a cup of country music, contemporary music, everything else. But then they tell you, you know, they just don't get preaching. I had a lady tell me this past week, I invited her to church. She said, I'm looking for a church. I said, I said, well, we'd love to have you. She said, my church is changing. She said, it's not the same. She said, all we hear anymore is we ought to love one another. She said, and that's great, but that's not all there is to the Christian life. I said, wow. <laughs> Don't meet too many people like that. I don't know, oh, good night. <laughs> she, I was like, you must be Baptist. <laughs> she was like, you know, there's more to the Christian life than just the love, lo loving one another. 
And, and, and churches are changing, preachers are changing, and I, you, know, you watch in this world, you watch the, uh, the political debates, all that nonsense, and you can just see how the America is just going downhill fast, but people are still thirsty. Amen. And I loved how it said, Oh, everyone that thirsteth come. Well, anybody thirsty this morning? Maybe you've not gotten a hold of God. Maybe you'd like to know more about God. Maybe you don't know if you died that you'd go to heaven. Well, God says if you're thirsty, come get a drink. Amen. I love that. Come ye to the waters. And look what it says here. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Good night. What is God thinking? God's telling people, hey, if you're hungry, if you're thirsty, come. And if you don't have any money, come anyway. Wow! God, you're not looking for something in return? God, you're not looking for me to come and give you what I have so I can get what you have? No, I love it. God says, come, and he that hath no money, come buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. There's no price for what God has, amen? There's no requirement for what God has. It's all free. You just got to come. Boy, I love that. What in the world's God thinking? Boy, God must be crazy to give away salvation for free. God must be crazy. You know how I many people would love eternal life? I know I love having eternal life. I love that I get to look forward to heaven. You know, how many, you know how much money God could make off us if He's put a price on heaven? People all over trying to earn it. What if God put a price on heaven in the Bible? What in the world is God thinking? God must love us. Good night. God must love you to be willing to give you heaven for free. Boy, good night. God must love you. What in the world is God thinking to give you salvation absolutely for free? That's why I love to go out and tell people, hey, you know, Jesus loves you. That's why he died. People believe in a work salvation. I say, well, if you believe in works, then why in the world did Jesus die on a cross? Why did Jesus die? If Jesus came, died, shed his blood, was nailed to a cross, put crowns and thorns in his head so you could get baptized. Right? Jesus came all the way to earth put nails in his hands and feet, shed every drop of blood in his body, was scourged with a cat of nine tails so you could go and join a church to go to heaven. Right? No, look what Jesus said. He says, come by without money. There's no price. God doesn't put a price on the cup of water. Are you thirsty? Nanny. What have you got? Boy, well, God doesn't do that. God says, are you thirsty? Are you thirsty? Mason, I'm going to pick on you since you're right there. You thirsty? No. Amen. Okay. Well, you can't have it then. See, it's not God's fault that you don't get water. God's provided the cup. It's not God's fault if people don't get saved. God says, if you're thirsty, come. There's no price. Got to talk to a man this past week. He said, you know, I've been taught that if we get baptized as children, it gets rid of our sin. I told him, I said, why did Jesus die then? I said, and besides, I said, this is Wichita water. I said, if any water would save you, it wouldn't be Wichita. Amen. Amen. Disgusting. But it's because Jesus says, come by. Amen. Look at this, number two. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Boy, now God asks a question. God says, it's absolutely free. Anybody that's thirsty, Come. Anybody that's hungry, come. No price. But God says, so why in the world do you spend money for that which isn't real? Why do you labor for something that doesn't satisfy? You go out in the world and you tell them, say, well, if that's really the case, if you really believe that that's the way to heaven, why aren't you satisfied? Why are you laboring for something that doesn't satisfy. Talked to a man this last week. Amen. And I loved how God gave me illustration after illustration from soul winning and put it in the Bible. Talked to a man this last week. Going to church. Went to church as a young boy. Still goes to church. But it doesn't quite satisfy. I told him, I said, it's because church is not what satisfies. The Word of God is what satisfies. Jesus Christ being on the inside is what satisfies. But God wonders, why in the world do people spend money for that which is not bread? Why do they labor for that which satisfieth not? You know why? Because they don't know. Why don't they don't know? Because somebody's not taking the cup. Somebody's not saying, hey, are you thirsty? Would you like a drink? 
Okay, so he wanted a drink, so he got a drink. Are you thirsty? You thirsty? Would you like a drink? Okay, here you go. Good job. Are you thirsty, sweetheart? No, you're not thirsty? Wow, terrible illustration. No. Are you thirsty? Are you thirsty? Are you thirsty, brother? He's like, are you thirsty, Miss Cindy? Would, you, would you, anybody care for a drink? Anybody thirsty? That's what soul winning is. Soul winning is walking around with a cup and say, hey, are, are you thirsty? Thirsty? No, you're not thirsty. All right. Well, you know. Hey, are you thirsty? No, okay. Well, yeah. Uh, are you thirsty? No, you're okay. No, no. Are you thirsty? Yes. Let me tell you what you hear. Oh, and then what's the goal? Now, hey, now that you've been satisfied, now you take this. Now here, you come with me. You go that way. I'll go this way. We'll cover the whole room, and boy, we'll be good. All right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know that's what soul winning is. Soul winning is taking that cup and saying, "Are you thirsty?" But people labor for that which doesn't satisfy. They spend money for things they that don't work. Why? Because there's not enough of us reaching to them first, saying, "If you're thirsty, God says, just come." Amen. There's not enough of us that care. So how do you know? Because I don't care as I should. I prayed, I said, God, I need a more of a burden for souls. Amen. I need more of a burden to reach people than ever before. I need more of a burden to help people. Amen. Boy, God wants to reach a city, but He needs somebody. What in the world is God thinking then? Why would God trust one of the greatest the, or the greatest message to you and I. God must be nuts. Right? I said, God, you're nuts if you told me to go and give the gospel. God, you could have sent angels. You could have, you could have sent Moses back from the dead. You could have, God, could, you could have done anything. But you want me? God, you must be nuts. What in the world are you thinking? And then God reminds us, we read in verse 8, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. You know, it doesn't make sense to us, but God has a reason. God has a plan. Remember the rich man that died and went to hell? He looked and he cried for just a touch of water. Just a touch of Water. You see, people are thirsty for God. And when they get to hell, they'll be thirsty for eternity. But he said, hey, go at least to my brother. Send somebody from the dead. They'll listen. God says, if they won't listen to who's there now, they wouldn't listen if somebody came from the dead. God sends you and I because we are the only ones that can bring other people to Jesus. If God had a better way of getting the gospel, don't you think God would have done it? If God had a better way of people getting saved and had a better percentage, as much as God loves people and God loves sinners, if God had a better way of getting the gospel, don't you think He would have done it and not told us to go do it? Absolutely. So that must mean that God knew we were the best way to reach people. Why are we the best way to do it? Why? I'll tell you why. Because when somebody comes to you and they try to sell you something, and not sell as in money, but they try to tell you, hey, this will work. I've never done it, but it'll work. They're not going to trust you. I wouldn't trust them. You're telling me this will work, but you've never done it. Okay. I wouldn't trust to go to a mechanic that's never worked on a car but tells me that he knows what, how to fix one. I'm going to trust him. He's never done it. And you know what? The angels don't have to get saved. Okay. Angels don't have to accept Jesus as their Savior. Angels' lives aren't changed for eternity. You can't see because they're perfect. But when a sinner gets saved and gets transformed and they drink of water that's thirsty and they're satisfied... One sinner going to another sinner saying, Hey, I've been where you've been, I've sat where you've sat, and I drank this and I was satisfied. You need to do the same thing. All of a sudden now, wow. That worked for him. Maybe that'll work for me. 
That's why when you go to your family, your family say, and they say, hey, you know what? You're different. Well, you're a different person. Let me tell you why. I've got a satisfying thirst. I'm satisfied with Jesus. All of a sudden now your family, wow. What's God thinking? That's what they think. God saved you. God saved you. God changed your life. Do you know what you were? You know what you used to say? You know what you used to think? And now, and God did that for you? It must work. God wants to use us because God wants to show the world it works. See, the devil puts out cops, not police, cop outs, fake stuff. He tries to tell you, here's my water. This will satisfy. This will, or try this. Or, or, or try this. Maybe, you know, try baptism for a while. Ah, try your church membership for a while. You know, or try this. And the devil, what does he do? He hides from you the truth. He hides from your family the truth. And somebody needs to come along and say, you know what, I tried this and it didn't work. I tried this and it didn't work. Let me tell you what works. All of a sudden, that means more. That's why God sent sinners. What's God thinking sending us? We're lazy. I know I am. We don't always want to go. God's got a battle with us. God's got to drag us out of bed sometimes. Time goes so winning. But God, five more minutes. Please. You know what I did last night? That baby woke me up. Make her sleep better at night. Then I'll go. Well, God, you know what happened to me? I ain't got time to go. God's got to drag us, people. The most important message that God's, that's ever been on this planet, and God's got to drag us to go. What's God thinking? God knows you're the only hope. Amen. Look this, verse number 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. God gives us a warning, too. God says, seek the Lord while he may be found. You know, God's not always going to be found. God is not always near. If you miss that opportunity, you miss that opportunity to invite that person to church or tell them about the gospel. You miss that, they may not have another chance. God's not always near. God's working on them for a reason, and then God puts on your heart. Go give them the gospel. Go talk to them. You say, well, God, not yet. God, not yet. God, no, I can't do it. Send somebody else. God says, remember, I'm not always near. Death comes to all of us, amen. Eternal separation from God is in hell. God's not near, amen, in a, in a lake of fire. Well, we've got to go while God can be found. Hey, Jesus is coming back one day. There will be no hope then. Amen. We've got to go while God can be found. We've got to take the time now while God is near. Amen. Look this. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon why does God do that? People, if we look at it and we think about it, why would God have mercy upon the wicked and upon the unrighteous? Why would God abundantly pardon somebody that hates Him and spits in His face and curses God's name? Why would God love somebody that would do that? Why would God have mercy? And I love that word. He doesn't just pardon. He abundantly pardons. Boy, God forgives everything. Well, I love that. Amen. When I got saved, God abundantly abundantly pardoned me. Every sin I've ever done, every sin I ever will do, God's mercy was so strong, it covered everything. God abundantly pardoned. Why would God do that? Because God says, my thoughts aren't your thoughts. Boy, it's a good thing we're not God. Well, if we were God, we'd be like, hey, you go to hell. 
You've met people like that. Oh, good night. That guy, sheesh, what a jerk. Ah, sin, and God, God kicked him off the face of the planet. You know what he's done, God? Send him to hell. God says, now my thoughts aren't your thoughts. My ways aren't your ways. Well, God, why don't you send somebody else? Because God says, that's not my way. God, why don't you, why don't you reach people, somebody else? Why don't you send a pastor? God says, because that's not the way it needs to be done. God says, that may be your way, but that's not the way it should be done. Those may be your thoughts. Boy, God, that guy can't get saved. God says, that may be what you think, but my thoughts are different. God, I can't witness to them. They won't get saved. They're not going to listen. You see that crowd of people? They're not going to listen to me. God says, that's not what I'm thinking. God says, I've got a different thought. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, verse 9, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down and snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the water. Here's a great verse to underline. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. God gives us a promise that His word would not go and come back empty. It would accomplish exactly what God sent it to do. It's not our job to win people. It's our job to go and give the gospel, give the word of God. God's word goes out, and when it comes back, they may not get saved, but something happened. God says here, they planted a seed. Or maybe it watered the earth. And maybe some bring forth and but It reminded me of an illustration. That we were out sowing. And boy, all the acorns are falling everywhere. <laughs> if you've seen that, it's that time of year. Acorns are falling everywhere. Walnuts are falling everywhere. <laughs> so we were walking by. And uh, John and I under this tree. And man, I, <laughs> I was you know, hiding my head. I mean, because they were bouncing on the sidewalk. <laughs> I was like, what in the world, man? <laughs> Acorn falling everywhere. And, you know, they felt they were all over the place. I mean, I mean they were, all, we were stepping on, you know, you try to be quiet, walk up to people's doors. They're like, oh, good night. Acorns everywhere. You know how many of them will be trees? Oh, probably not many. And, you know, it, it reminded me, that's what we do with the gospel. We go out and we plant seeds. Not all of them take root, but you don't know which one will. You just go out and give it. You just go put it in your hope. Maybe it'll, maybe that one will. Maybe that one will. You know how many doors we knocked this past week to see 15, 17, 20 people saved? 300 and some doors. That, that, that's a lot. I mean, that, that's a lot of doors, a lot of walking. I wore Brother Gary way out. I had to put him on a table and massage him almost. Yeah. <laughs> He had to sit in that recliner, take a break. Oh, it's a lot of doors, a lot of walking. But you know what? There was 15 or 20 people. It took us three, maybe 400 doors. We didn't count all the tracks. We had so many. It's a lot of tracks. And you never know who's going to take it. But you're going to have to just keep going. You don't know which one will work. Amen. Look here. Verse 12. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. I want you to know something. Pastor, boy, I don't have joy as a Christian. How do I get it? Look what it says. For ye shall go. How do you get joy as a Christian? Go out. For ye shall go out with joy. When you go soul winning, when you go try to give people the gospel, when you go to give the word, you don't know what all it'll do. You may not reap. You may just plant. You may just water. But when you go, God will send you with joy. Pastor, what do I need to do for joy? Go soul winning. Go tell people about Jesus. Pastor, what do I do? I, I, I'm not finding joy as I ought. What do I do? Go out. Quit sitting on our duff, letting people die and go to hell. Get out there. Go tell somebody about Jesus. You'll start smiling. Well, they listened. 
Brian and I were sewing. Where'd Brian go? There he is back there. Brian and I were sewing, man. We, we, we led this guy to the Lord. And Brian's like, well, that was cool. Hey, man, I said, you're right, because the guy, it was like a setup. You ever, you know, you've just been set up, you know? My grandfather, when he met my grandmother, it was a blind date, you know? One person just said, hey, you want to you go for a date, Thomas? And he's like, sure. Goes out and meets Sarita on a blind date, and then they got married. <laughs> I mean, he didn't ever see her before. They got married. Here I am, you know? I mean, it worked, so yeah, praise the Lord. You know, it was a blind date. They were set up. That's what it felt like. I just got set up. Somebody brought me here, and I didn't even know it was on purpose. What's well, God? Amen. God sets you up. That brings joy. Why? Because God used you. Hey, go this way. No, uh, 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 right there. Perfect. Stay there. Don't move. Oh, okay. This door. Somebody comes to the door. Hey, I'm gonna tell you about the gospel. I mean, basically, it's like, please. You're like, really? <laughs> you you, you, you want to know? Yeah. You know you're a sinner? Yeah. Really. I don't got to convince you. No, I'm a sinner. Okay, fine. Well, sinners go to, if sinners die and have to spend eternity in hell, that's the payment for sin. You believe that? Yeah. Do you want to go to hell? No. Really? Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Well, Jesus said it's a free gift. All you got to do is trust him. That's it? Yeah. You believe that? Yeah. Okay. If you call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. You simply need to trust Jesus and accept him as your Savior. Call upon him in faith. Ask him for that gift of eternal life. Would you like to do that? Yeah. Really? You want to pray right now? Yeah. Okay, well, let's pray. You're sure? <laughs> I remember one time I was leading the guy to the Lord. He goes, yeah, let's pray. And he just starts praying. Dear Jesus, please save me. I was like, <laughs> wow. I've been set up. It's God that does that. You know, that brings a smile. That brings joy to know that God would use me. Amen. I lost my Bible. I lost my page. Here we go. Back to Isaiah chapter 55. For you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Now I want you to see something. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. It shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. When you go soul winning, you're going out to the thorns and the briars of the world. When you give the gospel to that family, it's the thorns and the briars that the devil has conned and used. And when God's word goes out and reaches into the heart of a sinner that has been sin-struck and rotten to the core through sin, all of a sudden God says, instead of the thorn will come the fir tree. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, and look, for an everlasting sign. Boy, God wants you to be a billboard. Look what God did to me. Instead of the thorns of the world, God gave me a fir tree. Instead of the briars of the world, God gave me a myrtle tree. Instead of the junk that the devil offered and the life that I lived that was useless and just caused pain and problems, now God's given me a fruitful life. But it's because it gives God a name. What kind of a name do you give God? It says, that shall be to the Lord for a name. What kind of a name do we give God as Christians? God has saved you, and instead of the thorns and briars, God's given you a fruitful life. But do you still live among the thorns and briars? We should be growing over here, but instead we're spending time with the thorns and the briars of this world. Remember, the, remember God, uh, Jesus gave the illustration of the seed, and it, was, and it was planted, and it grew, and it tried to, and it tried to grow, but the thorns, what they do? They choked it, killed the seed. They were saved, born again, but their Christian life never amounted in anything because they were choked by the thorns. Right. You were a thorn. You were a briar. Now you have a fruitful life. But we decide to live amongst this world. We give God a bad name. Right. Right. People say, ah, oh, they're hypocrites. They say they're saved, but they... 
look like me, talk like me, act like me. What did God give you instead of what I have? See, God says here, I love the word, instead of. God replaces what the devil gives you. The world wants to know, this is what I have. What did God give you instead? If they think we have the same thing they have, they're not going to want. They're not going to come and get this. Because God's not helped you any, God must not help me. That's why it's important we live for the Lord. We begin to separate ourselves, begin to look like a Christian, act like a Christian, walk like a Christian, talk like a Christian. Why? Because the world wants to know, what did you get instead? My brother Gary was talking about his testimony, something that I loved. That he was saying he, got, he didn't get rid of drugs because he got saved. He got saved, loved it, appreciated it. Amen. He didn't get, get rid of drugs till he tried to give, you know, he wanted to give the gospel and said, I can't do that. And somebody make fun of my Savior. You know what he knew? God tells us as baby Christians, as growing Christians, you can't go and represent me and have the world. The world's not going to want what you have. And some of us, we may not see people say, well, why not, God? God says, you're still living in the thorns and the briar. And you're not showing people what you have instead. You have it. It's on the inside. God wants to use it. And God wants to show His light through you. But you won't give God a chance. God, I just, I like this. I like the thorns and the briar. I love the world. I love the way I live, the music I listen to, the way I have, all these things. I love that, God. And God can't use His power to flow through us because the world sees that we're not instead Christians. Amen. A couple of ladies went to the ladies' retreat, and it was a lot of fun. And I'm glad that they got to go and got to grow. Why? Because we need to know how can we be better Christians. Why? Not so we can brag. Look at my Christian life. Boy, look at my tree. Boy, look, what, look at the tree God gave me. Now, you do that. We grow as a Christian. Why? Because God says we'll be a sign. People look at us and go... Wow, look at what God did. Boy, you look like a Christian. Boy, you, you, you're just different. You know, you, you think differently than I do. You talk differently. You, 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 everything's different. And God wants us to be an everlasting sign to this world to say, Hey, God gave me in, something instead, and I love it. Amen. What kind of a name do we give God? Amen, dear Christian. When you go out and you give the gospel, what kind of a name are we giving God? What kind of a name do our family see? Our family see us day in and day out. Do they see a change or are we the same that we used to be? Are we growing? Amen, and everybody, and all of us have to grow. We, we all have to keep, none of us have reached the epitome of the Christian life. Amen, even as a pastor, I have to keep growing. Amen. If I don't keep growing, something's wrong. Amen. I'm not the perfect Christian here. Amen. I'm sorry, uh, newsflash. I, I apologize. I have to confess that to you. I'm not the perfect Christian. I still have to grow. You still have to grow. We're all growing. If you stop growing, something's wrong. You get to the place where oh, I know everything and I don't have to change anything. I'm perfect. <laughs> By all means, there's a door. You don't need church anymore. Why are you here? But we need, why? Because we still have to grow. Why? So we can be a better sign to this world. Hey, wow. Well, look what God gave me instead. What in the world is God thinking? Why would God love us? And then I want you to think about your life, think about where you're from, where you come from. Why in the world would God love you and I? Think about even though you're saved, think about how many times today already you've let God down. Why in the world God loves you? I don't know. I don't have an answer. I just know He does. But it's because we don't think like God thinks. And I'm glad God doesn't think like I think. I'm glad God thinks a lot differently. Amen. Why in the world would God use us to give the gospel? I'm not sure. But you know what? It sure is a lot of fun 
sure is a lot of fun to go out and give the gospel and look up and say, God, you know, I'm not sure why you'd use me to accomplish a miracle like that, but thank you. Amen. You don't know what you're missing out on. Get out of the thorns and briar of this world. Get out of that. Get, just, get, just get rid of it. Just decide, you know what, Lord, I've been living in, in, in this junk too long. I want to have a fruitful life. And I want people to see a difference. I'm tired of telling people there's a difference. I want people to see it. I want my family to see the difference. I want my friends to see, you know, I'm not the same. And what they ought to see is that we're not the same as every other church in town. Other churches, they're trying to do their part. But when they don't preach the gospel, they don't have what you have. And if you're going to convince other people that you have something they don't, you're going to have to show it. You have to be that sign. Amen. What in the world is God thinking? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for a wonderful day that you've given to us. Thank you, Lord, for the message. I pray that it was a blessing. Lord, I pray that you'd use it in our hearts. Lord, may we decide to, Lord, allow you to use us. Lord, I don't know why you use us. I don't know why you love us. I don't know why, Lord God, you gave your son, why you sent Jesus to die on an old rugged cross and put nails in his hands and nails in his feet, why you put a crown of thorns on him and allowed him to be scourged and allowed him to go through all the pain and suffering that you did. God, I don't know why. What in the world, God, you were thinking. But, Lord, you said you did it because you loved me, and I thank you for it. And I'm sorry, Father, that I don't love you as much in return. Lord, I pray that you'd please would help me and prick my heart. May I love you more. May I, Lord, be willing to serve you more. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. I pray that you'd bless now the invitation time. May we, Lord, uh, be willing to respond as the Holy Spirit spoke to our hearts. May we, Lord, come forward to an old-fashioned altar. God, nothing wrong with coming forward and making a decision. Lord, may we move as the Holy Spirit moved on our hearts. May we move to, Lord, the front, and may we make a decision. Lord, we love you. Pray that you'd bless now the invitation time in Jesus' name. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Let's all stand.